Hello. So, uh, yeah, I'm Stefan Graeber. I'm the project leader for uh, Linux containers. And I'm just switching to the right screen here. There we go. Um, and I'm one of the, one of the Incus, Incus maintainers. Uh, I was also the former project leader for LexD when I was working at Canonical. So, um, gonna go for a tiny bit of history first, uh, and then go into more of you know, what Incus is and what can you do with it. So, um, the LXC project itself was created way back in August 2008 um, through IBM. Uh, that's the kind of original Linux containers uh, runtime and was, has been used kind of everywhere, including the original version of Docker and some other places um, at that point. Linux containers itself uh, was created, so the organization was created back in September 2013. Uh, and the LexD project got announced by Canonical in November 2014. Then LexD has been going on for a while uh, until a lot of things happened in 2023. So on July 4th, Canonical announced that LexD was going to be moved out of the Linux containers community project and moved into uh, can the Canonical organization itself. The next day, we noticed that all non-Canonical uh, maintainers had lost all privileges on the repository, so only um, Canonical employees were left maintaining it at that point. Uh, then a few days later, I left Canonical, um, so that happened. Um, then August 1st, Alexa Sarai, who was the um, OpenSUSE packager for LexD, decided to go ahead and fork LexD as a new um, community project called Incus. A few days after that, we made a decision to include Incus as part of the Linux Containers project, effectively giving it the spot that LexD once had. Um, Inca 0.1 was released in October, on October 7th, and we've had uh, another four releases since then. And uh, lastly, just as a bit of an early Christmas present, uh, Canonical decided to go ahead and relicense LexD uh, to a GPL, as well as require everyone to sign a CLA to contribute to LexD. Uh, the consequence of that for us as an Apache 2 project is that we cannot look at anything happening at Le in LexD anymore. We can't take any changes from LexD anymore, so Incus is effectively a hard fork at that point. So that's the history. Now uh, to go back to what is this thing actually all about. So Incus is a system container and virtual machine manager. Um, it's image based, uh, so you've got a pretty large selection of distros. There's going to be a whole slide about that a bit later. Um, but uh, yeah, it lets you effectively kind of cloud-like immediately create instances of any, from any of those images. Uh, the system container part means that we run full Linux distributions. We don't run application containers. We don't run OCI right now. We don't do any of that kind of stuff. The containers are really like a full Linux system that you then install packages kind of the normal way. Everything is built around a REST API with a pretty decent uh, CLI tool. Um, that REST API also has other clients. We'll go through that in a tiny bit. Um, Incus got great support for resource limits, so you can pretty easily limit CPU, memory, disk, network, I.O., whatever you want. Um, it's also got extremely good device pass-through to both containers and virtual machines, so you can do things like passing GPUs or attaching virtual TPMs or uh, sharing your home directory or doing a whole bunch of different kind of sharing and passing through of devices uh, into containers and virtual machines. It also supports all of the expected stuff. I mean, it does snapshots, it does backups, it's got a variety of networking options, a bunch of storage options, all of that stuff. Um, it can also create projects as a way to, um, to group a bunch of instances together, and effectively even OpenID Connect, which is kind of the go-to standard these days. Um, and for authorization, we support OpenFGA, which is the open fine-grained access control uh, project. That gets you, as the name implies, pretty fine-grained access control. Um, there's also a number of uh, web interfaces you can use on top of that. So here you've got one of those, which is actually the LexD web interface that uh, runs perfectly fine on top of Incas. Uh, and yeah, that's one of, uh, one of the options there. Uh, as far as what you can run, well, there are a few options. Um, you, can see, you can see up there. So Incas is indeed all based around images. Um, we build images for pretty much all of the major Linux distros, uh, and even some of the not so major. Um, and we build uh, everything on both x86 and ARM. The, the vast majority of them are available uh, for as both container or VMs. We've got a number of them that are just for containers. 
And then because we do no more VMs, you can also run Windows, FreeBSD, whatever hell you want, whatever else you want inside of, um, inside of the virtual machine. All right. Um, so let's do a first quick demo of kind of the standalone um, in-class experience. So if I switch over there, um, first thing we'll do is just launch uh, Arch Linux container. There we go. So we've got that. Then let's do a, another one for, let's do Alpine, uh, the Edge release. So just do that. Um, and this is obviously at risk of blowing up at any point because I'm on the FOSDEM Wi-Fi. But uh, Ubuntu, I think Ubuntu, I was planning on doing a VM, yeah, okay. So let's, let's do a VM instead of a container, so just tell it you want a VM instead. Uh, that's pretty much all that there is to it. Um, and with that running, so we can see that the two containers already started, got their IPs and everything, the VM is still booting up, so it hasn't got its IP yet, it does now. Um, if you want to get into any of them, you can just exec any commands, you can get a shell into Alpine, uh, you can get a full bash inside of Arch, and you can do the exact same thing with the virtual machine. So like, you don't need to like, get a console and log in and everything. Like, you, there's an agent automatically in our virtual machines. You get to just immediately access them as if they're containers. Um, so that works really well. You can create snapshots. So if we wanted to snapshot, uh, put it snapshot create, say, on the Arch one. If you don't give it a name, it just picks one for you. Um, so we can see there's now a snapshot that we can restore or just keep around. Uh, there's also the ability to do automatic snapshots with like a cron type pattern with automatic snapshot expiry. You can do all that kind of stuff. Um, now let's create a custom storage volume. So we'll just do storage volume create default. Let's create uh, group storage volume uh, create. Whoops. Let's call it demo, and then we're going to be adding that as a device to, let's say, Arch. So um, let's call it yeah, demo. It's a disk. It comes from the default storage pool, and the volume is called demo. Um, configure this there, and I forgot to do add. There, device add. Now, if we go inside of that VM, again, we see there's a new entry there, an MNT home. Hey, that's my home directory. So that's very nice and easy. It's kind of doing automatically uh, Verta UFS, 9P, all that kind of stuff. It talks to the agents to trigger the mounts. And it, it just, like, our goal is for virtual machines to feel like containers in, like, as much as we can. And having that agent in there really makes that super easy. Um, and for the last party trick of this demo, let's do launch images, open SUSE, tumbleweed, desktop KDE. Uh, as a desktop image, and we also tell it that I want to see the VGA console as soon as it starts. So when I do that, it actually gets me a second window, which I need to drag over here, and let's try and full screen that thing, maybe. Yeah, full screen doesn't work, okay. Um, but we can see it boot, and it's gonna get us eventually into a, into a KDE session. Not sure why the reach size didn't work. Oh, okay, maybe the desktop will. I saw a mouse pointer that was about the right size. Nope. OK. So it is starting KDE there. Uh, so we even have imi some desktop images. We've got an Arch desktop image with GNOME. We've got Ubuntu with GNOME. And we've got OpenSUSE with KDE. Um, we're not building too many more of them, mostly because they are, they are actually very expensive to build as far as like resource, like the build time and distributing pretty large images. Uh, but it's to show that this works. And if you want to run your own, you can totally do that. All right. So. Uh, let's just go back to slides. Uh, come on. Where is my slide? There we go. Um, so, um, other things you can do. Uh, as this thing is effectively your own local tiny cloud, and it's all built on REST APIs, well, it also makes it very easy to integrate with other things. And other things here mean um, some of the pretty usual tools you might be dealing with. So Terraform or OpenTofu, you can integrate with that very easily. We've got a, uh, a provider that we maintain ourselves that you get to use. Um, Ansible's got a connection plugin that you can use to deploy uh, any of your playbooks directly against uh, virtual machines or containers. 
And if you want to build your own images as derivatives of ours, you can use Packer as a very easy way to take our images and inject whatever stuff you want in there. Um, there are a bunch of other tools. I mean, LexD especially had a lot of third-party tools that could integrate with it. A bunch of those are now migrating over to Incurs or supporting both. Uh, so that's, that's very, it's a list that's very rapidly growing. Um, other things you can do, well, Incus exposes um, an open metrics endpoint to get the, the details like the resource consumption and usage and all that kind of stuff of all of the instances running on it. So you can, you can integrate that with Prometheus to scrape that data and keep it on the side. Um, it also supports streaming, logging, and audit events to um, Grafana Loki. So you get to effectively have your events and your, and your metric in the same spot, at which point you can use uh, the dashboard that we've got in the Grafana store uh, to get something like that and run on Intel. Um, so that's pretty convenient as well. Um, if you don't like typing the name of your remote every time, you can switch to a remote. So you just do a remote switch, uh, at which point if I do a list, it goes straight to that remote and you don't need to type it every single time. Um, that cluster is actually using uh, a mix of local storage and remote storage. So it's got Ceph for Ceph uh, Ceph, uh, HDDs, Ceph uh, SSDs, um, and it's got uh, a local uh, ZFS storage pool as well. And on the network side, it uses Oven. So it actually has, has all of the uh, high availability stuff in place. Uh, and actually, if we look at the remote list from earlier, uh, we can see that it uses OIDC for login. Um, so it's also using the authentication bits I mentioned. Now, if you wanted to launch, uh, say, I don't know, a Debian 12 instance on that thing, uh, you, can, you can do it the perfectly normal way. And that's just going to instruct the cluster to go and do it. Um, so in this case, thankfully, it's running on my, it's running back home with very fast internet. So uh, I don't need to wait for the first Wi-Fi to download stuff for me. Um, but it's effectively downloading the image, unpacking it, creating the volume on Ceph in this case, and then starting the instance. Um, I didn't even tell it whatever I wanted it on, so it just picked wherever it made sense, which is actually funny because if you use an image um, and you don't specify what architecture you want, you're going to get one of the architectures. So in this case, I didn't tell it I wanted ARM or Intel. There was more capacity on ARM, so I got an ARM instance. Um, if so we can go and check that easily, but I know that the server it picked uh, in that list is an ARM server. So if I go on here and look at the architecture, it's AR64. All right, um, let's just look at things here. Um, there we go. And I wanted to just show the dashboard as well. I'm just going to need to drag that particular window over. Uh, where is it? It is here. I had it open. I've got way too many windows open on my laptop. Um, OK, so it's Grafana. Loading, loading, and in case dashboard. Okay, and just making sure it looks at the right cluster before I show it to you. So, there we go. Yeah, so uh, this is actually the dashboard for the very cluster I was talking to. So it's uh, SHF, the one I was showing. It's looking at the demo project. So we can see kind of the top offenders as far as resource usage or that kind of stuff. We can look at graphs for uh, network, for storage. Um, and we can even kind of go down on the specific instances and see what, uh, what they've been doing. So you could expand an instance and go look at its usage. Uh, it also gets all of the events from Loki, so we can see the instance creation and running commands. Like that, that shell I got is actually right here. Um, and any error and stuff is also all captured right there. So that's the uh, kind of the metric side of things. All right, um, so where do you get to run this thing? Well, um, quite a few distros have packages now for, for Incus, uh, as well as, I mean, as I mentioned, uh, Debian and Ubuntu will have packages in their next stable release. Uh, we're also looking at doing a long-term support release for Incus itself. Uh, right now, you might see version numbers like 0 0.4, 0 0.5, and be a bit scared about it. Um, you need to remember that this is a derivative of LexD. Uh, so one of our zero point release is just as stable, if not more stable, than like a five point something on the LexD side. We've just not done anything past zero because we're waiting for the LTS of our other projects within Linux containers, uh, which we will do in March. And that's going to be the LTS of LXE, LexCFS, and Incus all at the same time. 
and we usually try to line up versions. So Incus is going to jump straight from 0.6 probably straight to 6.0. Uh, that's what's going to happen with the LTS. Um, as far as other features we're looking at adding, um, with the release of Linux 6.7, we now have BcacheFS in the Linux kernel. And it's pretty interesting for us uh, on the Incus side because it's very close to what ZFS or BRFS does, which we already support. Uh, so we're looking at adding a BcacheFS uh, storage driver uh, for people who want to, to start using that. On the clustered side, I mentioned that we support Ceph right now, which is a pretty good option, but also a bit heavyweight. Um, a bunch of people could instead do something different, whether it's like using a shared NVMe of a fabric drive or using uh, some old fiber channel sand they might have gotten on eBay or something like that. Uh, so we're looking at adding distributed LVM as a storage driver, which effectively means if you have multiple systems that can all see the exact same block device somehow, then you can use LVM on top of that uh, with a uh, distributed locking manager on top so that uh, all of the different uh, machines in the cluster get to use that. So that kind of solves the issue of like, how do I use that my old SAN at work or something like that? You can use that. Um, but it can, it can also work in some other cases. I think someone is looking at using that with DRBD, for example, as, a, as an option. Uh, we are looking at adding OCI application container support. So that's potentially a bit of a, a surprise for some folks. Uh, but we feel that these days, um, like the, the kind of application container space has now stabilized enough, and we've got enough of our users who literally just run, who, like for some reason, are running Docker inside of Incus to run a few specific applications. Uh, that this particular use case we could support natively. Uh, so we're not looking at like competing with Kubernetes with all of the service mesh dis auto distribution thing. Like that's, that's crazy stuff, they, they get to do that. Um, but we would like it to be possible for you to run like two or three small uh, containers for like your IoT software or whatever. Uh, that's kind of what we're looking at doing there. Um, and on the networking side, uh, we, as I said, like we're using Oven for distributed networking, which works pretty well. Um, but uh, we're also working now on another feature of Oven, which is called uh, Interconnects, which then allows for having multiple clusters and then interconnect to the network. So you can have um, instances on multiple networks on multiple clusters and then connect those together and then can rat direct them. And you've got 30 minutes with Incus pre-installed in there to just take it for a ride, play with it for a bit, see if that's something that's interesting to you. And if it is, then you can go and install it for yourself. Uh, and that's it. We can try some questions. We've seen it's a bit of a, a bit difficult. So please, everyone, remain quiet if there's any questions. So we can try and hear them. Um, is there anything? Oh yeah, over there. Okay. Some questions from people aiming in the with the differences from the end there. And this too. Um, where exactly is like the main caveats of what it can? Uh, compared to what? Sorry, I didn't catch that part. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> VMware. Oh, VMware. Okay, well, <laughs> so uh, it's a lot cheaper. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, for I mean, for anyone who's who's using VMware professionally and has followed the news recently, um, let's say. Yeah, your, your VMware bill is not great right now. Um, so this is a viable alternative in many cases. It doesn't do, like it doesn't have all 50,000 components all around it and all that kind of stuff. But if you were primarily using it as a way to get a cluster, create a bunch of VMs, maybe create some containers, run whatever OS you want on there, uh, that will do it just fine. Uh, so it's definitely an option there. I mean, it's, it's kind of in the same vein at that point uh, compared to like, you know, a Proxmox or some of those other options. It will work just fine. Um, with the fact that like, we do have, like, like, it's not a distribution. You can install it on any system you want. Um, it's obviously all open source. And yeah, it is a pretty viable alternative. And we do have a lot of people who are using VMware that are very closely looking at this as a potential way out of VMware right now. <laughs> So the question here, to better understand the terminology of the is that what are the elements that find the battery between a system container and an application container? Yeah, so the difference between application containers and system containers is a system container will run like a full Linux distro. It will run systemd, it's going to have UDEV running, it's gonna, you'll be able to SSH into it, install packages, uh, reboot it. It's really designed to be like a stateful, long-running type thing. 
um, whereas your application container is usually, I mean, ideally single process or a process of some of its children, it's really more designed around delivering a specific application and most often it's gonna be quite stateless with the idea that you can just nuke the thing and replace it, not, replace it at any point. Um, it's, it's kind of two different concepts. Like some people like the idea of having a system that they actually get to select what packages install, exact config and stuff, and some people decide, prefer not to care about any of that and just have something pre-installed and that's what an application container gets you. Um, that's why having the ability to run some application containers directly on Incus alongside the system containers I think will be quite interesting uh, because if you just, like if for a specific application it's easier to just get their pre-made thing then you'll be able to do that uh, while still being able to run everything else. I have a question. Um, fish, fish shell completions or completions for batch as well. So we do have a uh, bash completion profile. I absolutely hate shell completion for some reason. So I don't have it on my machine, so I can't show you. Uh, system containers, uh, uh, provides, um, the ones uh, mm -hmm. provides. Yeah, I mean, the, like, it is possible to get uh, application container runtimes to get you a full system container. It's, I mean, nothing prevents you from deciding that the application you run in the container is, has been in it. Um, that's definitely possible. It's just not what they were really meant for. So there's a bunch of kind of, like they, it, it just feels kind of less polished because that's not, that wasn't their goal. Um, like things like, you know, being able to dynamically pass new files in, dynamically um, uh, attach, attach devices, get whatever number of shells you want. Uh, be able to interact with the outside world through like a Unix socket inside of there. Those kind of things don't make too, too much sense for application containers just at the beginning. Uh, and so those, some of those features will probably be lacking on that side. Um, like I tend, I mean, well, I was gonna say like I usually like, you know, having one tool for the job and like picking the, the well, picking the right tool for the job. Uh, and effectively, if you really care about running a bunch of application containers, use one of the application container runtimes, uh, whether it's using Podman, Docker, or some of those others. Uh, one thing that's actually interesting is that you can totally run Docker or Podman inside of an Incas container. Um, so that works. You can, you can run your a normal Ubuntu, Debian, or whatever Linux distro inside of an Incas container, and then install uh, Docker or Podman in there and run some containers alongside whatever else you might be doing in that container. So that's something that works fine. I think we're probably out of time at this point. Um, so thanks a lot, everyone. I'm probably gonna just be outside for a tiny bit if anyone has more questions and things. Uh, but yeah, thanks a lot.